Welcome back to the show. We're talking about the APEC summit this week in Beijing and the current state of the U.S.-China relationship. Our CCTV colleague, Wang Gwen, recently sat down with U.S. former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice. We will bring you some of their conversation in a moment, but uh, let's go back to our guest, Dr. Tung. Uh, other than the climate deal, which was mm -hmm. the big announcement in Beijing that we just talked about, how successful would you say this APEC summit was? What was really achieved? Of course, this is, this, you know, this is a very important occasion for China to show its confidence you know, in uh, dealing with the challenges all over the world and in Asia-Pacific region, for example. Uh, how can you know uh, the all the member states in this re region you know uh, cope you know with the uh, financial crisis and also the uh, connectivity and other you know uh, proposals you know by the Chinese side. So this is very important to you know to show Chinese you know uh, determination and uh, willingness to cooperate with all the member states in. Uh, especially in economic areas, and uh, uh, I think you know after this summit, you know uh, actually China continues its uh, effort. For example, in recent you know uh, summit in Myanmar, the with with ASEAN nations, China also promised a lot for the you know development and uh, for the cooperation in economy. So I think uh, APEC this time in Beijing actually. It's not only a show for the witness, but also, you know, China uh, preferred to, you know, uh, practice its, uh, you know, uh, ideas or concept in reality. Talking about cooperation, Jim Nolte, uh, President Obama praised China for its role in the Iranian nuclear talks, as well as China's role in the response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. How did you read uh, the relationship between the two men at the summit? It looks like it's improving. I think there are, this summit does represent progress in the relationship. It isn't uh, extremely dramatic. There were some positive signs also in China's relationship with the, the other APEC countries, uh, in Southeast Asia in particular, with the uh, offer for new loans and so forth. Uh, but it does represent an incremental step forward, I think. You know, the CCTV correspondent that I mentioned, Wang Gwen, he recently asked uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice to give us her assessment of the state of relations between China and the United States. Let's watch. We view the U.S. relationship with China as one of the most consequential and important relationships in the world. We aim to deepen and strengthen our cooperation across a broad spectrum uh, of areas. Um, where it is in our mutual interest. Uh, and we think there are many such areas, uh, economic, security, diplomatic, global health. There's a, a broad range of areas where we can, we can and we should cooperate more. But we also think that we have to be clear uh, and forthright about where we differ and work to manage those differences responsibly so that they don't evolve unnecessarily into confrontation. That's how we view uh, this relationship, and we think there is potential for a great deal of progress. Dr. Nolte, how uh, would you describe Susan Rice's assessment of the relationship? Well, I think what she said is quite correct. I mean, obviously, there are still areas of disagreement, but they're manageable. They haven't caused any uh, serious ruptures in the relationship in recent years, and progress continues to be made in new areas, such as the climate agreement. And so I think it's a, a hopeful step forward, uh, not necessarily a dramatic change in the relationship, but. Uh, things are moving forward rather than reversing. That's a good thing. Mr. Tang, Susan Weiss there saying that there are a great many areas where the two countries could cooperate, but she also did say in that short excerpt we played that we should be, that is the United States, should be clear and forthright about where we differ and work to manage those differences responsibly. Mm -hmm. How did you see her assessment? Uh, of course, everybody knows that the relationship between China and the United States should be the most uh, complicated uh, relationship in the world. And uh, actually, in recent years, we have witnessed the competition uh, between the two countries, you know, has been intensified, especially in security, you know, and the economy. You know, in security, we have witnessed the, you know, the deployment of uh, uh, U.S. most advanced weapon system very close to China. and. Uh, in the area of economy, of course, you know, the United States is now in favor of TPP and China now 
is in favor of RCEP and uh, you know during APEC uh, you know uh, summit uh, chi China also proposed the FTAAP so I think the competition actually is inevitable for the two you know uh, largest country in this region but I think the the as we discussed just now you know the two countries as rice just mentioned you know uh, they, they share the common interest in, in cooperation in dealing with, you know, the non-traditional threat, for example, uh, terrorism and other, you know, challenges in this region. I, I'm sure this is actually a common ground for the uh, two countries to go ahead in their cooperation. Right. You mentioned terrorism. That is uh, one area where many people see a great deal of common ground between these two countries. Uh, Wang Gwen, our correspondent, did ask Susan Rice about that. Let's listen to what she said. Many are asking at what level and through what specific programs will China and U.S. work on combating the threats of terrorism? Well, we've invited China uh, to play an increasing role in fighting the threat that ISIL poses. We have a joint interest in uh, stepping up our cooperation uh, to build a peaceful and stable Afghanistan, but also to, to deal with the threat of terrorism from that region. So we do think there's real scope. Uh, for China and the United States to do more together to deal with genuine threats of terrorism. Dr. Nolte, are we going to see lots more cooperation on this particular issue, the issue of fighting terrorism between China and the United States, particularly now as the United States is starting to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan? Certainly that's one area where there's common ground, and I don't think any particular antagonism, both the United States and China, maybe the China even more so than the United States, are threatened by Islamic extremism. and so. China, in its own self-interest, uh, has an incentive to cooperate with the United States in this issue area, and uh, it, it does seem that, that that continues to be an area where cooperation will develop as we go forward. The other person that our correspondent Wang Gwen spoke to was the former U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Henry Kissinger. Um, he talked in his book, his recent book, uh, about American exceptionalism, and he explained how both countries differed in their approach. Let's, let's listen to what Henry Kissinger said about that. The Ch Chinese exceptionalism is not missionary. The Chinese exceptionalism is cultural. That is, uh, it uh, does not attempt to make the world Chinese. It bases itself on its performance and then expects a level of respect that is appropriate for the occasion. The American exceptionalism is more missionary. And it is possible that some disagreements can, de can develop uh, on those grounds. But I would say the test of our two leaders will be the ability to uh, understand that there are maybe some different approaches, but there's a greater necessity in peace and progress in the world. Dr. Tang, let me get your view on what Henry Kissinger said about the differences between Chinese exceptionalism and American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think China and the United States did have some differences in uh, this regard. For example, uh, the United States, uh, you know, uh, sometime you know, used the so-called double standard toward the uh, terrorist uh, activities in China, and China sometime, you know, uh, protested such, uh, you know, uh, uh, attitude toward the terrorist activities in uh, in this country. So I, I, I think uh, we this time, you know. Uh, after the or, or during the APEC summit, you know, uh, President Obama and President Xi Jinping also touched upon uh, the this issue, and I'm sure uh, the this time the two countries, you know, are sharing the common direction. But in some specific areas, you know, they still have uh, you know much room to talk about and uh, to you know to find a, a roadmap to have uh, you know in-depth cooperation. Uh, between the two countries, because you know the terrorist, you know, actually is a globalizing, you know, uh, tendency. So for this, you know, I think that the the Chinese government and the United States should, you know, cooperate, you know, together. For example, uh, in, in UN, actually, you know, China and the United States are all in favor of the resolution, you know, two one 
seven zero. You know that uh, you know ask all the member states to suspend the uh, financial you know support and also uh, stop the uh, banking you know. Uh, for the terrorist group. So I think that actually China and the United States did have some cooperation in, the, in this area. Uh, Dr. Nolte, you know, when we heard Henry Kissinger talk about uh, the American exceptionalism of why America is special and that its approach is missionary and how it projects itself around the world, what is your reaction mm. to that? I agree with Dr. Kissinger. I think that's a very good point because what he's saying is that the United States sees itself as representing universal values such as human rights, uh, business uh, freedom, liberal, uh, open economy, uh, free markets, and so forth. So the United States sees itself in a, in a kind of missionary role to change the world in its own image. And only insofar as it does so does it feel like relationship, you know, relationships are, are good. Whereas China wants the United States to recognize that it has a different culture, it's a different country with its own system and its own values, and it wants to be respected as being different rather than being forced to change in ways that the United States believes should be universal. So I think that's one of the bases for the continuing friction that does exist in the U.S.-China relationship. And it's hard to overcome because it's based on fundamental differences in the national cultures. Uh, Henry Kissinger also had something to say about uh, the uh, evolving relationship between China and the United States and how they can work more together. Uh, Wang Gren also asked him about that, and let's take a listen to what he said. In your book on China, you coined the word co-evolution right. in the Pacific community. What exactly does that mean? Well, what it means is we should not require China to act like we do. China should not expect us to act like China does in all respects. What we should expect from each other or try to achieve is that we each develop our societies in the way we think are most appropriate. But as we do this, we keep in mind that we move towards similar and sometimes identical goals. So we, pro we progress side by side, but not necessarily to the same music. Mr. Tung, given the highly integrated nature of the world right now, what do you make of Dr. Kissinger's advice? Uh, yeah, that is a really good idea. You know, actually, you know, uh, China and the United States share different uh, social system, different uh, culture, different uh, you know, social value. Uh, this actually uh, structure uh, differences between the two sides. And uh, on the other side, I think, for example, in non-traditional security area, uh, I think China and the United States you know, are very willing to cooperate. For example, as we discussed just now, anti-terrorism and anti-piracy, and also you know, anti-Ebola and other disease in the uh, in, in, in the world. So, uh, I think we can separate you know uh, the, uh, the the differences into two categories. One is the structural you know difference that you know actually is there for many many decades, and uh, another is new you know areas actually. Uh, I think, uh, to my understanding, I think China and the United States are very willing to cooperate in the latter areas. That means, you know, in the you know the non-traditional non threats and uh, uh, areas. So this is a, a new tendency for the two sides, and uh, I'm sure actually uh, for China, especially under the new leadership of President Xi Jinping, actually China actually uh, seems to. Uh, adjust a little bit of its diplomacy from, you know, traditional responding to uh, the, you know, challenges in, in you know, its neighboring areas to, to, to shape the, you know, the situation or to shape the, you know, system or concept for the Asia-Pacific region. This is a, a great change or fundamental change for Chinese, Chinese uh, you know, foreign policy. Uh, in at least uh, uh, recent two years. So I think all the international community should be a customer to this you know, adjustment or change of uh, Chinese uh, you know, foreign policy. Uh, there's also another change, Jim Holt, and that is uh, the growing relationship between Russia and China. Vladimir Putin was at the APEC summit as well. Uh, does China benefit from a deterioration? And of course, we know that they are, there is a strained relationship right now between Moscow and Washington. Does China reap the benefit of that strained relationship? 
Yes, I, I wouldn't say that China benefits from it. I think that, that China, uh, as the United States and, and Russia, prefer to have a peaceful relationship throughout Asia. Um, but I think that to some extent China can, uh, can use its relationship with Russia as a kind of uh, balancing of any tensions that might exist with the United States. Uh, but I don't really think that the Russian-Chinese uh, cooperation fundamentally threatens the United States in any way. Um, as long as that cooperation is largely peaceful, which it has been. Mr. Tung, go ahead. Yeah, a actually, the, uh, there has been some worry from the U.S. side, you know, you know especially in recent years, in you know, after uh, the U.S. government adopted the rebalancing strategy. You now, uh, the relationship among the big powers, especially, you know, for the, for example. Uh, the relationship between China and the United States, uh, U.S., Russia, and the U.S., EU, EU countries uh, suffered a little bit, you know, be just because of the uh, rebellious strategy. You know, of course, on one side, the United States enhanced its relation with, you know, its traditional allies like Japan, the Philippines are okay. But on the other side, you know, uh, this strategy sacrificed, you know, the relationship among the big powers. So as we all know, you know, the relationship among big powers should be very, the most important, you know, a pillar for the peace and the stability of the world. If you know uh, there is any, you know, fundamental change of the uh, relations among the uh, big powers, we are, you know, reaching a very dangerous, you know, time. So I think if we also can learn from the history, if right. one, you know, uh, big power try to challenge another two, you know. I'm sure the individual you know, power should, you know, uh, failure, you know, in in in, in, right. in some in some you know, time. So okay. this is actually a lesson from the history. Yeah. Tang Jinthen, Jim Nolte, thanks to both of you for joining us. And that's it for this edition of the Heat. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to the Heat at cctv-america.com. And we'd like to continue the conversation on social media. Give us your thoughts and comments on our Facebook uh, page. That's at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.